Good evening and welcome to Q&A on this manic Monday after Super Saturday. I'm Tony Jones, here to answer your questions. Shadow Finance Minister Jim Chalmers. From Queensland, our People's Panellist Tony Winwood. Commentator Parnell Palm McGuinness. Communications Minister Mitch Fifield, And the editor of The Guardian Australia, Lenore Taylor. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Now, Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, Super Saturday was talked up by the media and the government as an acid test for Bill Shorten. But after Labor's victories, the government is back under pressure. Our first question comes from Sam Aragon. The weekend by-election came after some of Mr Shorten's worst weeks, but the opposition succeeded in retaining all its seats. As such, there's a stench of terminality in the air for the Liberal National Party after it has lost 35 opinion polls in a row. The trajectory is clear. Should there now be a reuniting leader to bring the party together and provide a point of difference to Labor? Is it Tony Abbott's time again? Um, I'm going to start with uh, Tony Winwood, our people's oh. panellist. <laughs> well, you come from Queensland. Mitch yes. is happy with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, it's funny that the thing I took out of the by-election is probably a little bit different, and Super Saturday for me was probably a little bit different too, uh, being getting married. But uh, I, I thought the by-election was interesting with Tasmania and the guy who had a two-week campaign and picked up 10% of the vote, um, which seemed pretty amazing um, considering how much money goes into some of the other campaigns. But, uh, you know, I guess it's status quo. We're back where we were before the constitutional crisis and... I think you uh, are you traditionally a liberal voter? I would or be. Or an LNP voter in Queensland? Uh, well, I've only just got to Queensland, yeah. so I'll have to see. But I, I would have been a liberal voter. Um, but I, I don't know who the Liberal Party is anymore, I guess. That's the what problem. Do you, what do you mean by that? Well, just some of the things that I would have thought Liberals stood for traditionally, which was, you know, smaller government, less taxes, less services, perhaps. Um, but uh, And more personal responsibility, which you presume... Someone's got to do these things, so let the people do it themselves. And I don't know that that's how it comes across anymore. And I think that might be why people just get a little bit lost. OK, Tony, more on that later. Uh, Lenore Taylor, we'll hear from our non-politicians first. Lenore Taylor. Um, so I don't think we should jump straight to sort of cataclysmic leadership options, but uh, I do think that any major party going into a by-election in a marginal seat and getting a primary vote with a two in front of it needs to start thinking about what lessons there are to be learned. And I think for the government, there's probably three. The first one is they, I think, have been putting a lot of store in Bill Shorten's relative unpopularity measured in preferred Prime Minister polls and the kill Bill strategy, you know, everyone talks about. Um, the voters in Longman in particular voted for Labor in spite of that. It didn't seem to be a drag on the vote. It didn't seem to be a huge factor. So I think if I was in the government, I would sort of wonder whether that really was as big a deal as I'd been making out. The second is company tax cuts. I don't think the government has made a convincing case for the company tax cut, and they've had it as a policy, you know, since the last election. Um, the, their own modelling shows that there is a small benefit to jobs and wages and to economic growth, but not for many years. If you're a voter out there, you'll see that the average wage is only just keeping pace with inflation, but that CEO pay is going up by about 12%. And you could be really well excused for not believing that you're going to see much benefit from a company tax cut anytime, let alone anytime soon. So I think the government, I mean, they just haven't made a convincing case. And I think you know, they really need Lenore, we're going to, to get into that. that particular issue in a moment. Just on the, on the leadership question, do you sniff that there may be any trouble uh, for Malcolm Turnbull on that front? And we see Tony Abbott's already coming out today, um, laying, staking out his claims on, well, I mean, on that but issue. His lesson was that everyone should have listened to him on climate change and, and immigration policy. And, you know, I don't think that really is the lesson from the, from the by-election at all. And I don't really see that, um, that the that there is a real coalescing of anything around Tony Abbott at the moment. But I do think that there's lessons for the coalition. I do think they need to have a think about it. I don't know. I mean, one of these days, political the major parties are, are going to actually understand that the transaction costs in a leadership change often outweigh any possible perceived benefit. I don't know if they've figured it out yet, but you'd think they'd figure it out sometime soon. Parnell. 
Uh, I've also got three lessons that I think they should be taking out for a minute. First of all, their polling sucks. It's consistently wrong. Second of all... Talking about seat polling now. Absolutely, mm. especially in Longman. That was an embarrassment. Mm. Um, next thing is the minor parties, wherever they are an alternative, and wherever they're strong enough to be an alternative, are being chosen by people. And thirdly, on the company taxes, there is not a clear articulate, articulated vision coming through from the government. Instead, what we have is this policy which is a little bit context-free and can then be read, as, as Lenora is saying, is saying as, um, as an issue, you know, you, you, none of us can see how this is going to flow through into a benefit for individuals because it's a really complex part of a very complex economy. You know, a company tax cut is something that has to be given along with a bunch of regulatory reform, workplace reform, etc. And in order to put that vision together, you have to put the whole narrative around it. Now, not just go out there and say, we're going to give company tax cuts and it's all going to be good. Of course that's not going to work. You know, trick no, I just, I just said to Lenore, we're, we're, going to, we're going to come to company tax cuts in a moment. So just uh, on uh, Sam Aragon's question, um, is it time for Tony Abbott to come back was his question. <laughs> no. No is the simple <laughs> answer. Um, <laughs> Post-election, we can talk about who might need to lead a reformed party, but really it has to be reformed around a new vision. Mm. It's not the leader that will make the difference. Post the federal it's, election. It's the vision. Yeah. That's right. OK. Mitch Feinfeld. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Uh, this was uh, an expected status quo result for an incumbent government. Um, I think we've got to come back to the, the fact that uh, no incumbent government in Australia has won a by-election from their opponents since... Uh, the Kalgoorlie by-election of 1920, uh, when uh, the sitting member was expelled from the parliament for sedition, uh, ran again uh, and lost. Uh, so they're the circumstances in which uh, incumbent governments um, have uh, the unexpected outcomes. So what we saw at the weekend is what we should expect. Um, if you want to contrast that with the experience of the West Australian government uh, in a by-election just a few weekends back, where they pretty soon after being elected, uh, had a swing against them of 9%. Uh, what we saw uh, in Braddon was, was basically no movement uh, in... Uh, so was, was the Prime Minister wrong, uh, Mitch, when he painted this as a contest between him and Bill Shorten? I mean, it was pretty clear what he said. No one on this panel missed that. So what did you think? Is, was he wrong about that? Well, what he said is that by-elections are about a range of things and that uh, those who are voting in by-elections... What about take that particular in, thing that he singled out? This is a contest between me and Bill Shorten. Yeah, well, what he said was that people uh, who are voting take into account a range of issues. Some people take into account leadership. Some people take into account uh, the local issues on the ground. Uh, others take into account national policy issues. That was the point. But I, I think we want to be careful that we don't um, over-analyse uh, these by-elections uh, and, and reach conclusions uh, which really uh, aren't supported by what happened at the weekend. So I mean, no, no lessons for you. We'll come. Actually, no, no, we'll, no, we'll come I'm to not, those lessons. No, sorry, I, I didn't I'm mean certainly, to certainly throw not, you certainly into not the, saying into that. The future. Certainly not saying that. The question has your hand up. I'm going to go back to uh, Sam because I'm sure your question wasn't answered by the minister. Two of those were nationally Liberal Party seats that should have been taken back. Mm. We, we know the history, but that it was a pretty big failure of your government, to be honest with you. It's, they should have been able to retain those seats. Sam, can I just ask, uh, where do you come from politically? Are you able to tell us that? Um, you don't have to tell us. No, I'll tell you. I, I'm, I'm a fizz mob. But the problem is that <laughs> we, have, we have lost our way. It, there's no glossing over this. Mm. All of these... And, and I'm only quoting our leader's point, or the leader's point back to you. 35 opinion polls in a row. The trajectory is clear. No spinning is going to change that. So what we have to do, or what you have to do, is uh, relate to us, those that will vote anybody but the Liberals at this point in time. We'll even go with Pauline. And what's the point of that? Um, Mitch, uh, I'll, I'll just pick you up on that. And, and can you just answer his question about Tony Abbott as well, just so we can get that on the record? Well, we, we are incredibly united uh, as a parliamentary party. Uh, Malcolm is uh, leading us... Well, 
that th them's the facts. Uh, Malcolm is leading us extremely well. If you look at the parliament, this is the parliament that they said would never work. This is a Senate that they said uh, the government would never be able to transact business through. Uh, yet we've secured the passage of more than 200 pieces of legislation. Almost every item uh, on our legislative agenda uh, we have secured okay, so through I'm, the I'm, parliament. I mean, I'm going to go to Jim Chalmers because uh, I think you've probably answered Tony Abbott is not going to uh, pose a threat to Malcolm Turnbull. Correct. It? Correct. Okay, thank you. Jim. Well, Sam, I think Mitch Fifield would have you believe that a swing, a primary swing against the Liberal Party in Longman of not more than 9%, where the Liberal primary's got a two in front of it and Labor's has a four in front of it, is some kind of status quo result. But I suspect from your uh, question that you might be smarter than that. He's also wrong to say to you that there's no uh, instability. Uh, in the Liberal Party, as you probably know. Anyone who uh, watched or listened to Tony Abbott on 2GB today <coughs> knows that we are entering another pretty dangerous period of instability for Malcolm Turnbull. And he brought it on himself. He did say to the people of Longman and Braddon, he said, this is a test of the leaders of the major parties. Uh, and his vote went backwards. Uh, Matthias Cormann said, please consider this to be a referendum on the alternative economic policies of Labor and Liberal. And the Liberal vote went backwards. We said, well, hang on a minute, what if it isn't actually about the politicians or the opinion polls? What if it's actually about what is a better use of $17 billion, investing it in our schools or boosting the profits of the four biggest banks in Australia? Now, I don't know, when people went into the polling booth in Longman or Braddon, I don't know which of those three things they voted on or if they voted on all of them. But what I do know is that that's what they were asked to consider by the Liberal Party, Malcolm Turnbull, Matthias Cormann and by Bill Shorten and the Labor Party. And the end result was a fantastic outcome, not just for the Labor Party, uh, who exceeded all expectations, but also for those communities who stood up for themselves and spoke up for each other and said there's a better way to invest public <coughs> money. Uh, just very briefly, Jim Chalmers, if, if uh, things had gone slightly different um, and Bill Shorten had lost one or even two of those seats, you'd be here defending his leadership against uh, a possible assault from Anthony Albanese. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you? Well, I, I thought these hypotheticals were um, not especially useful before the by-elections on Saturday, and they're <coughs> sure as hell not useful after the by-election on Saturday. We know what happened at the by-election, and Bill's approach to leadership uh, was endorsed. His approach to leadership is to get out in the ground in communities and listen to people to make sure that our policies and priorities align with the priorities of middle Australia and the people overwhelmingly got behind him. So I think the time has well passed for those sorts of hypotheticals about Bill. He's been through test after test after test. He's been underestimated at every turn in the last general election, these by-elections, and people are wrong to underestimate him. And okay. that was what we saw again on Saturday. All right, let's go to our next question. It's from uh, John McNamara. Thanks, Tony. With Labor winning four or five by-elections staged on Saturday, is the Turnbull government finally able to see that Australian voters know that trickle-down economics is badly on the nose and that tax cuts to major banks and multinationals should never ever be prioritised over correctly funded schools, hospitals and other government sectors and agencies? Ms Fryfield. Thanks. Uh, well, we're not prioritising uh, those things. What we're doing is pursuing uh, additional funding for schools, for hospitals, at the same time uh, as we're taking the opportunity to try and give Australians the opportunity to keep more of their own money in their pockets. Uh, that's why uh, we pass through the Parliament our personal income tax cuts. And this comes to a point that Tony made before, uh, saying, what are the Liberal Party's core values? Well, part of what we stand for is letting people keep more of their hard-earned money in their pockets because we believe that individuals are in the best position to know how to spend their own money. Uh, now, you can do that if you budget well, if you budget prudently, uh, at the same time uh, as spending more on health and more on education, which is what we're doing. So, um, Mitch, we mentioned uh, Tony Abbott this morning, and of course, in one of his regular forays into uh, coalition politics, he was on the radio today and he said there are no votes in company tax cuts because what the public wants is money in their pockets directly, not indirectly. And this is a former Prime Minister. Um, should he be listened to? Well, what we're about is pursuing policy on I the basis I'm, I'm, of... I'm talking now about what he's about and whether you should listen to him. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what we're about. He can speak for himself and I'll tell you what, what we're about. Is it disturbing how often he does speak for himself? Well, that, that, is, <laughs> that, that is the absolute <coughs> prerogative of a, a backbench member of parliament. Um, 
but uh, we stand for our principles, and our principles are um, allowing the, the community to have more of their own money in their pockets. It's about creating the environment and the circumstances where business can thrive. When business does well, uh, then they can employ more Australians. Uh, I know we're going to talk about company tax a little bit later, but the reason why uh, we want to pursue company tax cuts is because if we don't have a competitive company tax rate, uh, capital globally is footloose. Uh, what we are doing in that circumstance, if we don't change our company tax rates further, uh, is really giving a leg up to businesses overseas who are in uh, tax regimes which compare favourably to ours. That's okay. why we're pursuing this. Let's hear from Tony Winwood. It's, it's, uh, it's self-identified as a, um, a Liberal voter. So, yeah. I mean, do you think the company tax cuts are working strategically? Do you think they're being sold appropriately? Well, I would have thought if they are, they are important and if you believe that if companies are more profitable, they employ more people, which I guess a lot of economists would say, um, why take 10 years to put them in place? If, if they're that important to the economy, 10 years, we all know in politics, there'll be four or five changes of government and they'll never go through. So we'll never have them anyway. Um, if you need them, get so them So you out. don't actually <coughs> believe they really plan to do it? No, no. Well, well, even if they plan to do it, it won't happen because they won't be there for 10 years. And if they're not legislated now, they're not, I can't see how they happen. So if that's not that important, I would have thought the bigger issues for, for both parties is just the, the budget deficit and the debt, um, which I think, what, five years ago was going to kill us, and now it's about double. And yet I haven't heard anyone through any of the politics, any of the by-elections, talk about deficit and debt. And, I'm going to, uh, I'll come back to you in a minute. I just want to hear, I stopped Lenore Taylor and, and Parnell talking about this earlier, so uh, now you've got the chance because the question has been asked. So, I, I, as I said, I don't think the case has been made for company tax cuts. Um, I don't, see, the government's own modelling isn't very convincing about what benefits they're going to bring us. Um, I don't see, I see any shortage of foreign companies from lower tax jurisdictions than ours lining up to invest in Australia right now, so I'm not quite sure where the evidence is of the problem that we're trying to solve. And most importantly, I don't think we've had a proper discussion of what else we could do with such an enormous amount of public money. I mean, maybe we could get more investment or more wages growth or more jobs growth if we invested it in or put it into investment subsidies or into a really fantastic, better education system. Or maybe it would be better spent on services. I mean, these are choices and we're being presented with a massive change to the tax system at a time when our tax base is narrowing and it's quite worrying how we're going to pay for our level of services into the future without having a proper, intelligent conversation about the options that might be on the table. And I think that's why people aren't buying it. Uh, Parnell, uh, what do you think? And pick up Tony's point, if you like, which is so far in the future that you're not going to see it anyway because there'll be changes of government. Well, I completely take that point, Tony, and I think it's a really important one to make because companies need tax cuts now and small businesses who are the ones being hired by big businesses need, that fund, need those funds now. And that's why I'm talking about the importance of the whole narrative around the company tax cuts, because it really isn't just about companies getting a little bit more money in their pockets and potentially trickling that down, as everybody likes to say in this imaginary phrase that doesn't exist, mm. into the economy. So it really is about what are the parameters that we're setting in the economy so that businesses can make money, so that small businesses can make money from those big businesses, so that people can have jobs in those small and big businesses, and so that our entire country can continue along the trajectory of prosperity that capitalism, frankly, has set it on so far. Now, the Liberal Party really has to get better at explaining capitalism. We seem to have forgotten that spending money is not an investment strategy. Spending money and putting it into health is a good thing. That's something that we do when we have lots of money, which is generated by investment and businesses being strong and people being able to pay lots of income tax. I mean, these, that's how the economy works. Let's talk about it. Um, I'm going to throw to uh, Jim Chalmers because you've got the complete opposite opinion on the, at least the big business end of the company tax cuts. We do, Tony, but I also don't think it's a necessarily just a messaging problem. I think it's a problem of policy. And I think that John was spot on to say that what we saw on the weekend was really a repudiation uh, of trickle-down economics. And it's pretty simple, really, uh, for everybody except, I think, 
uh, Malcolm Turnbull and his cabinet, to understand that at a time when we've got stagnant wages, where people feel like everything is going up except wages, when we've got declining living standards and insecure work and all of these sorts of things that people actually live and feel and experience in the economy, they see the Prime Minister of this country saying that the highest priority in economic policy is to give a company tax cut where most of the benefit will go overseas, offshore, uh, and where the banks get $17 billion of that at the same time as they're before a Royal Commission and having all kinds of rorts and rip-offs exposed. And I can understand why people are filthy about that. Because the overwhelming priority for this country when it comes to growing the economy is that proper kind of inclusive, uh, people-powered, uh, bottom-up economic growth that <coughs> says you won't get that if you give the biggest tax cuts to the people who need them least. You won't get that if you keep hacking away at education. You won't get that if you ruin the NBN. You'll only get that if you give tax cuts to people who need it the most. If you invest in education, because that's how you invest in the productive capacity of the economy and invest in infrastructure, and you make sure that the tax breaks that you give to companies, as Lenore rightly pointed out a moment ago, uh, could be better done if we incentivise people who invest onshore in Australia in Australian jobs. That's how we grow the economy in an inclusive way. The trickle-down stuff has failed before, it has failed overseas, it has failed here. The only people who still want to cling to this long discredited notion that if you throw heaps of money at the top end of town that somehow everyone will benefit is the party that Mitch Firefield is part of and the party that Malcolm Turnbull leads for now. Um, Tony Winwood, you, I mean, you've heard <coughs> both sides expressed, yeah. you've, you've had your own opinion as well. Do you think the whole issue of the banks actually ended up killing off this policy for a lot of people? Well, it sounds like it did, it, and I think that's where I'd say the, the Labor Party's it's very good messaging to just get this to give $17 billion to people who've been ripping you off or send, spend it on health and education. Well, you go, oh, well, let's do health and education. Um, but I, I thought the banks had actually, uh, they paid $30 billion in fines, notionally, that, that, that they've got to pay over the next six years out of profits. So I think there's been a big slice taken out of, the, out of them already, and I guess they need to be able to pay that $30 billion uh, in fees for, for all the things that they've done wrong. Um, and they were also the people who saved us, notionally, the GFC 10 years ago. So I know they've done some things wrong, but I, it's a I, bit I, nasty. I'm going to let him respond to that. <laughs> I rather suspect he's going to say, no, Kevin Rudd and his economic policy... Oh, no. ..and his economic team actually saved the country. Sorry, but government that, but he, might, he might leave Kevin Rudd out of the equation. Yeah, no, no, of course. That of was course. back in the days when Labor believed in uh, company tax cuts. Well, those were the days where we believed in helping save Australia from the global recession. Uh, and there was a lot of good done in that period. Um, but I think the point that you made before, Tony, was a really important one, which is we don't hear enough about the fact that under the current government, we have had a net debt double. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess the point that I'm making, which is a slightly different point to yours, but, but does emphasise the fact that debt has blown out substantially under this government, is the fact that when you've got these big budgetary constraints you need to try and work out where public money can do the most good. Uh, and I don't think many people could argue convincingly uh, or objectively that the best use of public dollars, billions and billions of billions of dollars of it, when we have that record debt, is to give a tax cut to the companies that lead it, need it least and to the people who need it least. OK, let's just quickly, uh, a quick one on this, uh, Mitch. Um, is the government going to rethink this whole thing now? Uh, because it, there seems to be a clear message uh, coming out of these by-elections um, that the big end-of-town company tax cuts are on the nose. You probably aren't going to get them through the Senate anyway. Is it time to drop that policy, or will you take it through to the next election as a commitment? We will be taking the uh, company tax cut uh, legislation uh, to the Senate in the next sitting fortnight. Uh, we will be arguing the case. Uh, we'll be talking to our Senate crossbench colleagues. And Jim's smiling there. But, I am uh, smiling because uh, it wasn't exactly the question, Mitch. The question well, was whether but, we but, but anyway, I, 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 I want to direct something to Jim because... No, no, but Bill, first, no, no, can, no, no, can, no, can no, you just Tony. respond to that one thing? And then, of course, you can. But uh, just respond to... Will I, you I take it to Tony. the next election? Because that is the critical question. I mean, it's not going to get through the Senate or very unlikely to. So is that an end to it then? Or will you drop it completely? Or will you take it to the next election as an ironclad policy commitment? Tony, we always take things one sitting week at a time. And that's what we've done with uh, every piece of legislation we've had. And so Tony, a giant over-the-horizon tax reform 
is dependent on what happens Tony, in one if week. I can, if I can finish a okay. sentence, that would be terrific. Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, look, uh, Tony, um, time and time again, people have said we won't get particular pieces of legislation through the parliament. They said we wouldn't get the ABCC legislation through. We did. They said we wouldn't get registered organisations through. We did. They said we wouldn't get corrupting benef benefits through. We did. They said we wouldn't get childcare reform through, but we did. They said we wouldn't get school education reform through but we did. They said we wouldn't get the omnibus savings legislation through, but we did. They said we wouldn't get media reform through, <laughs> but we did. Yeah. Time and time again... They, they also said you're not going to get this uh, giant tax cut for corporations through, and you may not, and if you don't, what happens then? Tony, I forgot one. They, they, they said we wouldn't get personal income tax cuts mm. through, we did. Okay. They said we wouldn't get the first tranche of yeah. company tax cuts yeah, yeah. through, but we did. So every time, every time, uh, we're told, you don't have a hope, Give it away. Well, if this one time um, so, you fail, what happens next? <laughs> well, 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 Tony, we're going to take this the same way we take other legislation, argue so it's like merits. an alcoholic, one day at a time. <laughs> well, Tony, except uh, we've been remarkably successful. They said this okay. Senate wouldn't work, it has. But I do, Tony, just have to uh, go to one point which you cut me off from before. Bill Shorten was a passionate advocate for company tax cuts when he was the Assistant Treasurer of this nation. Every argument that we're using today in favour of company tax cuts, Bill Shorten did as well. But something's changed since Bill Shorten was Assistant Treasurer. The Labor Party now have this view that every dollar that is earned in the Australian community belongs to government. And government, benevolently, will sometimes let people keep a bit of it, sometimes a bit more. We don't take that view. Our view is okay. it's the Australian well, people let, let, let earn that money you wanted him to respond to that. and we so want them to we, have we'll, more we'll of it. We'll end this section by allowing him to do that. So, Jim Chalmers... He's had a good go so far. A quick answer. Why did Bill Shorten change his mind well, on company tax cuts well, a couple the top of, end? A couple of things have changed. Um, I mean, you doubled the debt, for starters. Uh, well, because we honoured some of your spending, well, debt's such doubled. as the NDIS. Well, no, you actually have to let NDN. him answer yeah. if you want to hear You ask me the Debt's doubled under the life of this uh, government. That's the first point. Uh, you've hacked away at health and education, and we've got different priorities for the country. We don't support this company tax cut, uh, which will flow overwhelmingly overseas and to the big four banks for three very quick reasons. They're unfair. They come at the expense of middle Australia. They're unwise because even the Treasury says that the benefits will be negligible and felt uh, down the track. And they're unaffordable at the time when we've got... Uh, record uh, net and gross debt. So those are the reasons why we don't support it. I don't think anyone is in any doubt about our position. The, the doubt that people have in the community is whether or not the Liberal Party will hang on to them to the election. Mitch can't say whether they can or can't. I think if Malcolm Turnbull was to abandon this, uh, this would be the final humiliation. This is his reason for being these company tax cuts. He has a one-point plan for the economy and if he abandons them, abandons them before the election, uh, he may as well give it away. Well, it's going to be one week at a time, uh, as we now learn. Uh, the next question is from Paul Vittles. Um, almost every political correspondent uh, grabbed a scrap of Anthony Albanese's speech and turned it into a seven-course feeding frenzy on Bill Shorten's leadership. Then after the Kill Bill narrative didn't work out on Super Saturday, they all denied responsibility and some shamelessly then ran stories about how safe Shorten's leadership was. Is it time for higher ethical standards for our media as well as our politicians? We'll stick to um, our non-politicians for this one. Uh, Lenore Taylor, um, it was interesting actually watching The Insiders because Barry Cassidy uh, put this know. proposition to the panel and there was an uproar. You know, how dare you suggest blah, blah, blah. So go ahead. So I have to give a slightly nuanced answer. I think the, uh, the importance of the by-elections for the Labor leadership was probably overhyped a bit before hand and probably some commentators did take it a little far but it wasn't nothing either there was uh, certainly talk in the Labor Party and um, the speech that Anthony Albanese gave I agree has to be read in context but he anybody looking at it could see that he was kind of presenting himself as an option there to be drafted should everything go terribly on Saturday um, some news organizations somewhat mischievously were running polls that looked at what would happen, should, what the vote would be under Bill or under uh, Anthony Albanese, ignoring, of course, the transaction costs we spoke of earlier. So I think there's something in your question, but I really don't think it's the whole, it's, it's the whole story. I think there was, it, the commentators were not making this up or confecting it, but possibly some of them took it a bit too far. 
Yeah, Parnell, are the media complicit in raising these issues, in creating these kind of dramas when they don't exist, or did it in fact exist? Well, a little bit of both. Um, so the media does indeed create these dramas because, of course, it's very interesting for people to to play a game of he, she, he said, she said, and, you know, the political melodrama really appeals to a lot of people. But the truth is that Albanese laid out a bit of an alternative policy platform and it was worth reporting on that because that points to an internal debate within the Labor Party, which it's worth voters hearing about. So I would be interested to hear from you, Jim, whether you believe that's true or not, whether no, you believe no. that... No, no, <laughs> no, we're going to keep the politicians out of this one, but I do want to hear from Tony. I mean, uh, do you think the, the media is obsessed with the Punch and Judy show and miss out on really giving a proper policy analysis? Well, there's, there's certainly a Punch and Judy show, and I, I, I suspect the same media is looking today and saying, well, what about Tony Abbott versus... Um, Turnbull. I mean, haven't we just been talking about that here? So we've well, just we just flipped from one to the other yeah. and now we're looking to create leadership tension on the other side. So I think it obviously makes good reading. But is it driven by the media or is it driven by mischievous politicians? Tony Abbott's out there today saying, you know, actually the corporate tax cuts well, well, I mean, he's uh, on, are, are unnecessary and not what people want. We should possibly get rid of them. He's on a radio show where everyone knows exactly what he's going to say and he's invited to say it and then it's reported on. So mm. to that extent, he's, he's part of the media pool. Mm. Um, but I, I would have thought if you want to see Punch and Judy, just put on Question Time because uh, there's plenty of Punch and Judy on there and that's happening. Does that, does, that, does it disturb you? I yes, mean... absolutely. It's a joke, really. I mean, and this is when you, you, you hear about let's have democracy back and let's talk about the policies and you switch on question time and think, well, can you hear anything other than snipe, snipe? But what do you reckon? I mean, you hear as a people's panellist, what yeah. do you think people actually want to hear? I want to hear policy. I mean, if, if there are big issues, tell me how you're going to solve them and don't play the, the party politics game. And... Also, this whole view that, th that there's only two parties in Australia. There's only Liberal and Labor. And independents, we, we shouldn't hear from them. They're not giving us a proper view. Well, independents are giving us an alternative view and they're getting lots of votes. Mm. And the big parties aren't the only people we should be listening to. And, you know, the Senate, I would have thought, is the place where you're exactly meant to hear from the non-parties. But you don't actually parties. mind the fact that uh, minor parties end up holding the balance of power in the Senate? I, I don't think so. I think that was the whole point of having the Senate. Mm. If, if it wasn't, why have it? Just mm. vote someone in the lower house and say, go and do what you want for three years. Mm. But we said, no, we're not going to do that. But you want the others to bring debate to the table. And we don't get the debate. You certainly don't see the debate. And I think that's the problem. All right, let's move on, and we will hear from the politicians on these questions coming up. Uh, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. And keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. Next question is from Wayne Meany. How thorough and comprehensive will the investigation into Emma Hassar be? Mrs Hassar has managed to manipulate the system so far, and how will this be different? Jim Chalmers, um, it's just the kind of embarrassment the Labor Party would not want uh, at a time when Super Saturday seemed to be a success, a crisis in Lindsay, a marginal seat in Western Sydney. Mm. Yeah, Wayne, I think there have been some serious issues raised. Uh, I don't know the extent of them. I don't know all of the facts. Uh, I do know Emma uh, and I do consider Emma to be a good person uh, going through a difficult time and I do know that when these complaints were... Uh, raised um, eventually uh, that she was um, very sorry about them. Uh, we have a, an independent investigation underway um, done by uh, a very considered and thoughtful lawyer uh, and because we take these issues so seriously um, we think it's important that we don't you know to respond to every uh, part of this story uh, but to see what uh, he uncovers and see what he concludes uh, and then come at it then. Um, but there's not really that much use uh, for me uh, to respond to different front pages of the telly until we all get all of the facts on the table. Um, is it a fair assumption that if any of these serious claims are upheld that you can't have a tainted MP in a marginal, critical marginal seat? Stand, you'd oh, have to do something about it, in other words. Look, I just don't see the point in, in that sort of hypothetical before we get all of the facts on the table. Okay. Um, and it's not that we don't take it seriously. We do, Wayne. Um, but 
Uh, I think there's a process underway uh, which won't take too long. Uh, and once we get all the facts on the table, then we can evaluate them properly. Mitch Feinfeld, um, already speculation that uh, Jackie Kelly might be resurrected <coughs> for Lindsay, and that would be an interesting uh, uh, contest. Uh, well, um, I don't think that's likely. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's ultimately, if, uh, if it happens, that there's a vacancy uh, in the seat of Lindsay, uh, because uh, the current member has to step down, then the party will follow its usual processes in selecting a candidate. But what I find uh, difficult to uh, believe um, in these circumstances is that Bill Shorten didn't know. Um, it seems there's a, a lot that Bill Shorten doesn't know uh, that occurs in his own party. Uh, he, uh, he didn't know that uh, he had uh, a large number uh, of his uh, House of Representatives colleagues who were actually ineligible to sit. Uh, of course he did know. Uh, and he was running a prote protection racket for them. Uh, so I think this is just another example uh, where the public will form their own judgment. As, as they did with the Deputy Prime Minister? <coughs> well, they, they will. Well, uh, but, but, it, but it's uh, a very uh, different uh, circumstance because yeah. the Deputy Prime Minister resigned immediately. Mm. Uh, that's the contrast. That's the difference. Fiona Nash resigned. Uh, Jackie Lambie resigned. The interesting thing is, with all of these, uh, but these, with all of these, these people, they've been voted back resign. in, all of them. Uh, so perhaps the public's not taking this whole citizenship thing as seriously as the High Court, for example. Well, I congratulate them on being returned, but uh, it does not take away from the fact that uh, there was a protection racket run by Labor for members that they knew were ineligible to sit. OK, let's move on. We've got another question it's from Amelia Chadwick. It's a very different subject. Uh, my father, who is 60, has been a manual worker all his life and was counting on retiring at 65. I can understand that people who've worked in an office could be capable of carrying on working till they are 67, but for many people in physically demanding occupations, their body is breaking down well before 67. He couldn't be here tonight, but his question to the politicians of the panel is, has the pension age been increased from 65 to 67 simply because it costs less to pay people new start allowance than the pension? People may be living longer, but what about their quality of life? OK, it's to the politicians, but I'll hear from the non-politicians first. Parnell. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, this is the... Uh, originally, um, the way the pension was designed was that it kicked in after the life expectancy of most people was over, um, which is not a nice thing to hear. And, you know, it's actually one of the great things of our society that we've managed to help people and extend the benefits to them at an earlier age and, and help them out. But we do have to remember that it is assistance. Now, in some countries, um, the pension age is different depending on whether you've been a manual labourer or a, a desk worker, because, of course, it does different things to your body. Um, but we are getting older, we are getting healthier, we're living longer. Work is actually good for most people. So perhaps this is just a, a point where we can look at individual cases or or manual versus desk work and say there should be a different age for those, for those people retiring. Lenore. Um, I'm sure the politicians are going to correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it hasn't been legislated yet. I think it's one of those zombie... 60, 67, 67 has no, been 60, legislated, but 67, but 70 70 goes to 67 yeah. in 2023. Yeah, but 70 it's already 65 yet. and a half now, and it's incrementally going up. In fact, when your dad um, reaches 2023, he'll be... 66, I think. Um, so, but he misses out by 11 months. Right. So there's people, I think, if they're born in in January of 57, then it's, I think, all right for them. But I believe he's missing out by, you know, a small amount of months. And but the final increment yep. hasn't yet been legislated. So that's sort of hanging around as a zombie policy. Um, this was always, I mean, I take... Well, that's the final increment is taking it to the time at it's 70 yeah. by 2035, I think. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's a complicated uh, thing to get your head around, except for the simple fact that a, a manual labourer will have to work until they're 67 before they can retire. And that's the point Parnell yeah, was... and I think that's a very good point. I think it's, it, you know, there needs to be differentiation depending on the type of work. And I also wonder how this... I mean, we, we were all sort of trained to think about we needed to be more productive, we needed to work longer. Now we're looking at a society where lots of jobs are going to disappear through new technologies, through AI or whatever. You know, I wonder whether we need to rethink the whole deal, the whole idea of it, because the whole nature of work is changing so dramatically. Uh, Mitch, um, it's a bipartisan uh, thing, I think, the, the retirement age. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, what do you say to 
that question. Is that a correct image? <laughs> oh, well, uh, it was by the... <coughs> in, two, in 2009, legislating to increase the retirement age to 67 yep. was bipartisan. We 70? supported the Labor Party to increase it to 67. Yep. When we put forward to increasing it to 70, uh, bipartisanship... Uh, didn't continue at that point. So the 67 age, there is... OK, well, let's, let's concentrate on the 67 age for the time being, because that is what this question is about. Um, is that wrong if you're a manual labourer? Because, um, obviously, her dad thinks it is. And is actually wondering whether you're only doing it to save money. Yeah, well, as, as Parnell said, uh, when the age pension was first introduced and age 55 uh, was the uh, eligibility age, uh, that was because uh, most people only lived for a short period of time after that. Uh, people are now living longer and living better, and as a former aged care minister, that's something that, that I think is great. Uh, so uh, it is appropriate, I think, that it was increased to 67, uh, because when you've got uh, a smaller and smaller proportion of the population who are of working age, uh, and you've got significant government expenditure, si significant and appropriate social welf welfare expenditure, uh, you do need to have uh, a workforce that's that's working, that's earning to so, so cover you those are, costs. Uh, th th we, we can admit this, you are <laughs> effectively doing it to save money. Well, it's, it's appropriate that, uh, that people, um, when they're living longer, when they're living better and healthier, uh, that uh, there is a, a later time frame to access the age pension. Now, there always has been in our social welfare system a recognition that not everyone is always physically capable uh, of, of work. Uh, that's why we have a disability support pension. So we've always had a recognition uh, that uh, there are people uh, who, uh, because of uh, the work that they've done uh, or uh, an accident that they've had uh, or um, uh, the situation uh, that they were born in, um, haven't necessarily been able to work. So that's something okay. that's right. always I'll been come taken. Amelia, I'll come back to you in a second, but I actually want to hear from Jim Chalmers, um, you know, <coughs> deeply steeped in this policy. Yeah, I mean, the issue that you raise, Amelia, about your dad is the main reason why we don't support in the Labor Party the pension age going to 70. Uh, we supported it going to 67 uh, at the same time as that was used to, um, uh, to pay for what was then the biggest increase in the pension in its history. So in about 2008 or 2009, there was a $30 increase in the pension, which came out of a uh, long and uh, distinguished review done by a guy called Jeff Harmer. And the trade-off there was we added two years to the pension age and we increased the pension by $30, which was uh, the biggest it's, that it's ever been increased by. But we don't support it going to 70, which is currently a Liberal Party policy, because we do think that there's an argument uh, that if you have been uh, working in blue-collar industries or, like my mum, spent 50 years as a nurse walking around uh, wards in our hospitals, uh, then it's harder and harder for you to continue to work until 70. 70 so would what about actually... 67, Jim? Because um, the, the point being made here and by some of our other panellists is manual labourers but labourers perhaps should be made an exception. Yeah. yeah, I understand Amelia's point and I understand Parnell's point. I guess what I'm saying is you've got to try and find you know, a fair age for retirement. We don't think 70 is fair for the reasons that you outlined about your dad and the reasons that I just outlined. The other thing about 70 as a, as a pension age is that that would actually make us higher than the US, the UK, New Zealand, Canada, et cetera. Uh, and so we don't think that that's striking the right balance. 67 is difficult for some people. Uh, 70 is near impossible for okay. a lot of people. Let's go back to Amelia. Um, were, you, were your dad here listening to this? What do you suppose he would say to the politicians? Just I mean, very briefly. I, you guys talked about the fact that there's sort of things in place for people who have disabilities and things, but when it comes to manual labour, there just comes a point where it's just so difficult it's hard to categorize someone as disabled but i mean a lot of these people are struggling like my dad couldn't come tonight because he's he's just exhausted from work he, he wanted to be here but he's just literally working and it's, okay it's killing him <laughs> yeah um I'm going to bring Tony in. Listen to this. Do um, you have any thoughts? Uh, should there be a change to this? Or I mean, it's sort of like the chickens are only now coming home to roost because there are people who are reaching the point where their retirement is coming up, or would have been, and 2023 is coming uh, is yeah. looming now, and they know they can't retire. I mean, I, I would have thought that uh, it has to be about money, saving money. Well, why do it? I mean, you're not penalising people because you want to, so you're doing it to save money. But <clears throat> I do wonder how politicians can actually sit there while they're taking 15.4% superannuation for themselves, with the rest of us on nine, and legislating what's a reasonable amount for someone at 65 to take out. And, and whenever I listen to it, I always go, I, I'm not sure how much longer people will accept that there's a 
a view for you and the public servants who implement it had a completely different view for everyone else out there as to how much you can have and when you can have it. 65 or 67, I mean, there's always going to be exceptions, but presumably you don't make any change unless you're looking to save money and it's spend it here or somewhere else. So. OK, let's move on. The next question is from Ross Sydney. Thanks, Tony. One Nation has put pressure on the government to reduce funding for the ABC as the price for its support of government legislation in the Senate. Has that pressure influenced recent decisions to reduce ABC funding? In the opinion of each of the panel members, does the future of the ABC depend on which major party forms government after the next general election next year? Ms Feinfeld, start with you. Thanks. Uh, well, there was uh, never any agreement with uh, One Nation in relation to uh, funding for the ABC. Uh, in the last budget, uh, you would be aware uh, that we uh, announced that there would be an indexation pause uh, for the next funding triennium for the ABC, which starts uh, in a little uh, under 12 months. Um, we've paired that with uh, an efficiency review to support the ABC. Uh, to uh, make sure that uh, it's the best possible steward of taxpayer dollars uh, that it can be. Uh, now, uh, we will uh, be providing uh, in the next triennium uh, in excess of a billion dollars a year uh, for the ABC, uh, and that's good because the ABC is one of the important underpinnings of media diversity. Uh, it also represents, uh, along with SBS, uh, one of the Commonwealth's significant contributions to civic journalism. Uh, and uh, the ABC uh, enjoys uh, greater funding certainty than any other media organisation in Australia, uh, and that's a good thing. Now, Mitch, do you accept that the, um, the funding freeze is effectively a funding cut of more than $80 million? Well, it, it, its effect is, uh, is a little over uh, $80 million. I put that in the context that the ABC will receive uh, in excess of a uh, billion dollars, uh, more than $3 billion uh, over the triennium. Uh, so uh, we think it's appropriate for all Commonwealth Government agencies uh, from time to time uh, to, uh, to look at themselves uh, to make sure that they're still being uh, as efficient as they possibly can be. Uh, I think that's a, that's a good thing. Would, but, it be, uh, would it be more logical to do the uh, review first and then decide how much the ABC could bear as a cut and then make the freeze? Well, we've, uh, we've announced uh, the uh, <coughs> funding efficiency review, uh, as I say, to support the ABC uh, in that work uh, of identifying where they can find uh, greater efficiencies. Now, uh, it's a little over three years since the last uh, efficiency review for the ABC. Uh, in the world of media organisations, uh, three years is an absolute eternity. Uh, and uh, we think that uh, there should be no uh, Commonwealth Government body that uh, is above uh, looking at itself uh, to make sure that taxpayers are getting the best value for their dollars. OK, so the questioner asked uh, whether this will be an issue um, that voters have to choose between two different parties or two different potential governments, Jim Chalmers. Yeah, too right it will, Ross. Um, what we've said is that we'll restore that $84 million that the Turnbull government's pulled out of the ABC just in the most recent budget. Uh, we wish we could restore the $282 million that they've pulled out ever since Tony Abbott promised no cuts to the ABC. Um, this is a big difference between the parties. Uh, Labor believes in an independent public broadcaster because what we, what we think is when the, the media landscape is changing as it is, when the middle of it is hollowing out so that it's easy and easier to find, you know, clickbait at one end of the media spectrum and you can still get high quality long form stuff at the other end of the spectrum, what people are really missing is that kind of middle um, of the media landscape, the, the role that, uh, you know, that Fairfax was playing, for example. Uh, and so we think when the media is changing like that, when it's easier to find us, I think President Obama said when he was in Sydney not that long ago, it's easier to find affirmation for your ideas rather than information to help you form your opinions. Uh, we think that that is a horrible time to be hacking into independent public broadcasting. So there will be a big difference at the election. We will invest in the ABC properly because we consider it to have a really important role to play in our democracy. Uh, and the other mob will cut it. Tony Winwood. I would have thought it's a fairly dumb thing to cut uh, funding from someone that you're just about to go on the panel and talk. So I'm sure we <laughs> have a lot to do. I'm sure someone else might have made the decision. 
Um, but <laughs> it actually doesn't sound like a lot of money, $80 million. It's, it's surprising that you would start to make enemies of somewhere that is going to talk to you uh, for $80 million when you look at... Well, what did the by-elections just cost? $120 million um, <laughs> of taxpayer money? Mm. Um, so to... to sort of have to take 80 million from, from the ABC, but I, I did... Do you take the view, I mean, the, the <coughs> questioner asked whether it's kind of um, uh, somehow sop to One Nation. One Nation obviously uh, doesn't want the ABC funded at well, all, um, like I mean, some members of the yeah. uh, young youth wing of the Liberal Party. I, I hope not. I mean, I'd have to sit there and hope not that it, we're not having the ABC funding determined by One Nation or... or uh, or Pauline Hanson and her views, potentially. Well, certainly, uh, to be fair, Mitch Fifield said that's not the case. Yeah, and, and you'd, you'd have to think that it wasn't because, as I say, it's not something you'd look to take on unless you really thought you needed it, but it's hard to make a case for it if you do it before the review. I thought I hadn't quite realised that, so I did smile when you said that. Uh, Parnell, um, what do you think? I think you'd probably lose more votes in ABC viewers than there are to be gained in Pauline Hanson votes. So it's probably bad policy if that were the policy. But look, I can only say you have got to always review government departments for their spending because it's not like they all do a wonderful job. And anything that is funded by the taxpayer, the taxpayer has a right to know that, that's, that, that spending is being used efficiently and, um, and is being used to produce something that we all genuinely do consider a public good and is not crowding out other goods, and that's very important. Yeah. We're going to move on um, uh, to more media questions. I've got a question from uh, Lawrence de Pellegrin. Diversity of media is key to any thriving democracy. Last week, Nine Entertainment proposed a takeover of Fairfax. Does the panel believe that Nine's checkbook journalism, as Paul Keating put it, could seriously threaten the integrity of Fairfax journalism and are they concerned about the concentration of media ownership in Australia? Lenore. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure uh, the Minister is going to say that the uh, takeover of Fairfax by Nine makes for a commercially stronger organisation that can better compete with Google and Facebook in the ad market where they're so dominant. And he's right, it will. The problem is there is actually no connection anymore between a commercially strong organisation and a journalistically strong organisation. Now, I mean, nine journalists do some good journalism, but it's very different from the kind of journalism that's done at Fairfax. And almost everybody looking at this merger and the cultures of the two organisations is very, very worried about what's going to happen to Fairfax journalism in that environment. I'm sure our colleagues at Fairfax, who are amongst the best in the business, will do their very best to continue to produce quality journalism. But I think we have, con have reason for concern. And that's coming at it. And this uh, contraction in media diversity in the most concentrate, one of the most concentrated media markets in the world, um, is coming at a time when there's really a real problem with civic journalism. There's a real problem with being able to, to create the kind of journalism, the kind of news, the kind of uh, holding the powerful to account that is really essential for our society, for our democracy. Uh, and, I, and, and I do think it's a concern. I mean, we created Guardian Australia five years ago to try to bring another voice into the Australian media landscape. By comparison with um, Fairfax, certainly by comparison with the Nine Entertainment Co, we're quite small. Um, but that's why, that's why we entered the market, to try to create a new voice. Now, this is going to make it more difficult for us commercially because the ad market has now got sort of these three huge uh, organisations in it. And I feel like this is an issue that really should be discussed a whole, a whole lot more. And um, I think governments around the world are, uh, are looking at how they support public interest journalism, and what they can do to stop the contraction of voices and the contraction of news sources. Um, and, I, and I really think we need to have that conversation here. But the one thing I would say is that as readers, as consumers of media, you have a choice and you can look for diverse voices and you can support them if you, if you like them. Mitch Feinfeld. Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, 
I guess two, two important uh, caveats is uh, one, uh, shareholders uh, still need to uh, approve this merger and two, uh, the competition COP, the ACCC, uh, still needs to run its competition ruler uh, over the proposition. But the, the reason that uh, uh, we have this scenario is uh, because last year uh, I changed uh, the media laws uh, which were drafted in the 1980s uh, before the internet existed uh, and uh, they had at that time uh, a range of uh, well-motivated restrictions on how Australian media organisations could combine together. Um, a lot of those media laws uh, don't make much sense uh, when you've got uh, the internet and you've got the uh, global online platforms uh, that are competing with Australia's media companies. So uh, what we did with the media laws was to slightly um, give some flexibility uh, to uh, make it easier for Australian media organisations to combine together where that made sense so they could get scale, so they could be in a better position to compete. But media diversity is important uh, and we still have a range of important uh, diversity protections. Uh, we've got something called the one to market rule uh, where a crowd can't own more than one uh, TV licence in a market. The, the two to market rule where you can't have a crowd owning more than two radio stations in a market. Uh, and something called the 5-4 rule uh, where you can't go below five independent media voices in metro areas and four independent media voices in regional areas. And we still have uh, the uh, more than $1.3 billion commitment to the ABC and SBS as well. Uh, so Mitch, I, I'm just going to pause there because um, yeah, there are a lot of rules. Um, but um, we, we know that the change... <laughs> protect diversity. Sure, yeah. I, that's right. And so there should be. But the, the Nines management, we know, are pretty ruthless about cutting programs. And if something's not making money, and if one of those or both of those major... Uh, mastheads of the, uh, what used to be Fairfax, still is Fairfax for the time being, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, don't make money, it's very likely that the ruthless management will just cut them because they don't make money. They're not like Rupert Murdoch, um, who has print in his blood. So what will you feel if the changes you've brought down end up in seeing both of those mastheads disappear? Well, I think the changes that I've put in place... Um mean that it is much less likely that uh, a major Australian media organisation will fail. Uh, I think if we did nothing, if we didn't change the law, if we left it as it was, uh, then you could say to me, Tony, uh, don't you feel responsible, Mitch, for Australian media organisations going out backwards? I think what we've done uh, gives a fighting chance to Australian media organisations and uh, obviously um, nine uh, are getting together with Fairfax because they see value uh, in the mastheads of the Sydney Morning well, Herald, the Age and the AFR. The value that they were AFR. talking about was the domain mm. real estate business and the stand streaming business. They didn't even talk about the journalism. And the radio companies. And the radio companies. Um, so would you mind if market forces just end up wiping those mastheads off the media landscape in the same way that Holden disappeared? I mean, let's not pretend that there weren't market forces at play sure. um, before uh, the, the media laws were changed. Yeah. Um, you know, th we don't have a static environment in Australia. But would media. you be sad? Um, but, but, Tony, uh, the, whole, the whole purpose of the changes that we've put in place is to increase the viability of Australian media organisations and the sorts of mastheads that we're talking about. Right. Diversity is important, but and and, and the greatest and the greatest, but the greater the greatest threat to diversity would be the failure of an Australian media organisation. Um, what we're hoping to do through the changes that we've made is to help enhance the viability of Australian media organisations. Right. So if it makes sense for them to get together, they can, uh, and they're in a better position to employ journalists. I just want to get a, a, sorry, just want to get a very brief response. Yeah. Uh, Jim Chalmers, um, I don't suppose Labor would wind back these rules. Oh, well, that's to be determined, Tony, but I think what I'd say to Lawrence is uh, I agree with something that Mitch said at the start of his answer. This change is the consequence of the uh, laws that they brought in uh, during the term of this government. And when they brought in those changes, they said uh, that this would protect Australian media companies, as Mitch has just said again. But all we've seen so far is we've seen Fairfax be swallowed up by nine, which has been a move that has been almost universally panned by people who know what they're talking about in the industry. And the reason that they're unhappy about it uh, is because we already had one of the most concentrated media markets in the developed world. And what this does will make that problem worse, not better.
OK, we've got time for one last question. We're running out of time. It's from uh, Jax Vittles, and we'll get short answers. Uh, thanks, Jax. Hi, thank you. Given the fairly reasonable result uh, for One Nation Party in Longman, um, does the panel think we might be better served by having cardboard cutouts for all of our politicians <laughs> instead of the real thing? Uh, Tony Winwood. <laughs> oh, wow. Cardboard cutouts. Um, well, I think probably we should well, all go on cruises occasionally. Well. Uh, you know, I think she had a nice little tour while that was going on, mm. and maybe all the leaders should have gone on a cruise and let the sort of electorate work out what they want to do. But uh, uh, I. I, I don't really know what else to say, Tony. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> cardboard cutouts did seem to work well, but it's it's probably more about who the who the people are on the ground. And and uh, he, he wasn't a particularly all that wasn't a great candidate, was it? And people thought, but 16% uh, of the vote, so uh, people like people who are different, I think. Mm. Uh, Jim Chalmers. I mean, actually, uh, Bill Shorten didn't put a cardboard cutout out there. He just disappeared. <laughs> Oh, on the contrary. No, on the contrary, Tony. He was no, in there. the last days I'm talking about. No, no, no. He, he was, uh, you know, Bill Shorten was in Longman very, very frequently uh, throughout the life of that campaign. Uh, on the Saturday of the election itself, uh, he was on, an he was on a uh, polling booth uh, until after dark, until the last voter went through the Moray Field polling booth. Uh, Bill Shorten was a big feature of our campaign. The day that Malcolm Turnbull was talking about, where Bill was dropping his kids off to school in Melbourne, was the day that Malcolm, in probably the defining image of the entire by-election campaign, uh, wandered into that uh, beer garden in Longman. Uh, and uh, when somebody gave him a serve about penalty rates, which is their right to do, uh, he started wagging the finger at them and, uh, and telling them how wrong they were. And I think that is a subset for what we're seeing now, which is Malcolm Turnbull is temperamentally unable to learn from what happened on Saturday. He doesn't listen to people. That's why they rejected him. We saw that in the pub in Longman. We've seen that in the 48 hours since the election results were known. He will not listen to people and we know he'll, he will not respond to people. Okay, I mean, I'm going to let Mitch uh, Fifield respond to that. Um, um I mean, Jim, you, you seem to forget uh, that uh, altercation that Bill had in the pie shop uh, when he wasn't happy with the standard of pie that he was served in Carlton. Um, you know, he was... Uh, you mean, you mean what, what, what is, it, what is it with politicians and pies? I mean, uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, apparently Malcolm Turnbull's not a real man because yeah, he, he uses a knife, a knife and a, fork a, to it. Anyway, anyway uh, what I'm contrasting... Oh, anyway. What, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> what, what, you brought what, it up, Mitch. Yeah, no, what I'm contrasting is, um, uh, you know, what, what a good, vigorous uh, democratic engagement on the ground with someone having a crack at someone behind a counter. Yep, fair enough. Um, and um, <laughs> Lenore Taylor. I just think it's a lovely metaphor for the protest vote being more about what people are voting against or what running away from than what they're voting for. Parnell? I think perhaps the cardboard cutouts would sometimes have a more coherent vision and a <laughs> more uh, convicted position than many of politicians. And I think maybe that's what people are reacting against. They're is too much moving away from policy because it's politically inexpedient and too little communication of what the narrative is and why they're in it in the first place. Uh, that's a good place to end. Um, that's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Jim Chalmers, Tony Winwood, Parnell Palm McGuinness, Mitch Firefield and Lenore Taylor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, you can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Tracy Holmes will be joined by investigative journalist Michael West. Well, next Monday, Q&A will broadcast live from Lismore with Agriculture Minister David Littleproud, Shadow Agriculture Minister Joel Fitzgibbon, the former Mayor of Lismore, Jenny Dow, National Farmers Federation President Fiona Simpson and a People's Panellist Matt Sorensen, an engineer who wants to see better planning and development in his region. Well, it's more than a year since the dual citizenship saga began. So to take us out tonight, please welcome Sammy Jay with the Ballad of Section 44. Until next week, good night. <laughs>
Well, Senator Scott Ludlam was the first to fall that night. He quivered like a coward and he didn't try to fight. Threw his arms up in surrender, then he lay down on the floor. How pathetic, said Section 44. Next in line was Xenophon and Canavan and Nash. They grabbed their birth certificates and tried to make a dash. But they tripped on Malcolm Roberts from one nation at the door. More like two nations, said Section 44. Section 44, one tiny little law. Written by our founders who were mostly born abroad. To keep us stand upright, to make our nation white. Yeah, they laid it like a landmine till it blew up in the night. Then it set its sights on Barnaby in Tamworth, born and bred. Body like a bull and a tomato for a head. But he was secretly a Kiwi, so it held him in its claw. Don't dream it's over, said Section 44. But Malcolm made it angry when he tried to force its hand. The High Court shall so hold, he said, but didn't understand that only fools predict what the section has in store. It answers to itself, and itself is Section 44, one tiny little law written by our founders a century before. To keep us self-contained, they patiently explained. Hell, it might destroy our parliament, they said, but it'll keep us entertained. As others fell like Lamby, Parry, Sky, Kokoshka, Moore. Did you renounce the section cried, but none of them were sure. They offered their careers up, but the section wanted more. Pay me back your salaries, it said, but they bolted out the door. Then Bill Shorten looked the monster right between the eyes. He said, my blood is pure and my party never lies. Then David Feeney and four others dropped their passports on the floor. These documents smell foreign, whispered Section 44, who's it coming for? The final legal hurdle that our leaders can't ignore. They tell us to behave, that we shouldn't break the law. Then they whimper like a baby when they're face to face with Section 44.